And now, let's move to a panel discussion on this topic. The challenge of preserving biodiversity and having economic growth and equity. This is a session with the 2023 year old laureate, Professor Eduardo Brondizio. Also in the studio with us here, we have Marie Stenseke, Professor, School of Business, Economics and Law here in Gothenburg. On link from Bonn in Germany, we have Dr. Anne Larigodri, who is Executive Secretary at IPES, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And on link from Florence in Italy, we have Thomas Sterner, Professor in Environmental Economics, Gothenburg University, but currently at Florence School of Regulation, European Union Institute. Welcome, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to start by asking you, Edward, about the acai fruit we saw in the film. It's obviously so that acai cultivation has boosted local economies, but some environmentalists claim expansion of the acai palms could also cause a loss of biodiversity. What is your answer to that? Thank you for that question, Nicholas. This is a really important question, and it is because there is no panacea. There is no panacea for solving the food problem in the Amazon, for solving environmental problems in the Amazon, uh, or you know, any of those questions. And acai cannot be seen as a panacea. Yeah. What we have seen in the film is the kind of acai production that is small and mid-scale. And you see in all occasions that is a mix of agroforestry and the forests. Mm -hmm. So at that scale, it has maintained biodiversity. Mm -hmm. It has allowed people to have more income, it has provided employment to hundreds of thousands of people in the region. Mm -hmm. The expansion of acai, on the other hand, has also led to homogenization and to monocropping, right? creating some of the same problems that we see with other crops. Mm -hmm. In some cases, however, acai has, is been used for restoration of pastures as well. Okay. So there is no panacea, mm -hmm. but acai offers a way in which you can reconcile local knowledge food production, employment, and also development for municipalities. It shows one way that we can pursue the challenge that we have mm -hmm. today in the Amazon. Mm -hmm. And in the film, you highlighted the social issues for the people in Amazonia. Yeah. Uh, are we generally overthinking about protecting nature and the forest and forgetting about the social dimensions? Both dimensions are important, mm -hmm. Nicholas, right? Uh, sometimes and often we tend to pay attention to the environmental concerns that we have, particularly when we think about a region like the Amazon and it's important to the globe. But in doing so, we may hide or forget about the scale of social problems that are at the shadows of the forest and the shadows of the city. So uh, we can co need to confront those problems, you know, f face on, and really bring them forward. Mm -hmm. A lack of attention to the social also hides the solutions and the responses that people have on the ground, mm -hmm. right? Many times that are shadowed by the problems that we see. Mm -hmm. So the environmental and the social need to come together mm -hmm. for us to confront the problems that mm -hmm. we have. Yeah, and to create the jobs. And, and I mean, you were mentioning the, the small, small scale producers here. That's uh, right. Maybe they are not that small after all, or? <laughs> Thank you for mentioning that. I think this is one of the biggest mi misconceptions that we have as a society when we think about small scale producers as we think as they must localize. Think about the acai case. It employs hundreds of thousands of people. It has transformed large landscapes in the Amazon. But more broadly, you know, one of the biggest crises that we have globally is unemployment in rural areas mm. because we disregard the importance of smallhold food production. Mm. But think about it. Smallholder farmers, the ones that are small than two hectares, mm. provide 35% of the global food supply. Now, if, you count, if you take into account family farms, we're talking about 70% of food production. Mm -hmm. If we talk about small-scale fisheries, as we have seen, that employs more than mining, energy, and other sectors together. Wow. So they have a scale. We just need to pay attention, to recognize, and to provide support so they can provide a good life for people uh, where they live. Excellent. Thank you, Eduardo. I now turn to you, Anne. IPVES is uh, sometimes compared with IPCC. And uh, expectations are that you will have the same role for biodiversity 
that we see that the IPCC has for driving the global dialogue on the climate change. It, can you do that and is that possible, you think? Yes, th thank you, Niklas. First, I wanted to, to say how uh, proud uh, IBES is uh, about Eduardo uh, receiving uh, this prize. Uh, as mentioned in the film, Eduardo co-chaired uh, the landmark IBES Global Assessment uh, Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services that has raised an unprecedented level of awareness uh, on biodiversity. It's been hugely uh, influential and IBES owes uh, Eduardo a lot. Now to your question. Uh, I would say that IBES is already uh, playing uh, the same role as uh, IPCC. So IBES uh, is informing, among others, the work of the Convention on Biological uh, Diversity, which through uh, its decisions requests uh, scientific reports from uh, IBES. So, so for example, uh, IBES uh, is soon going to embark upon an assessment on biodiversity monitoring. And the idea is to assist governments and others with their efforts to uh, measure uh, biodiversity and to do better in terms of the uh, outcome by better understanding the impacts of the measures uh, they take. So that is one uh, example of uh, how IBES is playing a role which is very uh, similar to what IPCC is doing in the context of the Climate Change Convention. That is great, Anne, and very interesting. And, but if I challenge you a little bit, I would still claim that in the general discussions in society, maybe biodiversity is not discussed to the same extent as, 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 as climate, change, climate change. Do you think that can change in general, or do you agree with me? So not fully, I, I don't fully agree with you there either. <laughs> and this time it's because I think that uh, biodiversity is discussed, but not under the word biodiversity. I think biodiversity actually is masking many other terms that people are actually discussing on a daily basis. Think about the degradation of ecosystems, the loss of pollinators as a result of pesticides and how that affects uh, production of crops. Mm -hmm. Think about reduced water quality uh, and as a result of fertilizers. Think about the emerging uh, of diseases, of pandemics, and mm -hmm. how we try to understand how that relates to deforestations, to wildlife trades. All of those are real issues that people want to learn more about mm. and that they are really discussing. So mm. yes, uh, biodiversity may not be heard as much as mm. climate, but the biodiversity related issues, I think are really very much at the core of what people uh, care about and, and want to solve. Mm. Oh, thank you very much, and for proving me wrong. Um, I appreciate that. <laughs> Let's go to you now, Thomas. Uh, in the film, we heard about the so-called tragedy of the commons, a situation where shared environmental resources are overused. This is a theory criticized by many, but it, what is your comment? We have overfishing in many parts of the world and other examples of natural resources being depleted. Isn't at least part of the theory valid? Well, these problems are real. It's just the name, uh, right? And Eleanor Ostrom is the person to, to turn to when it comes to the commons. And she spent her life trying to straighten up the, the terminology. And so uh, there is a problem of open access. If you have open access to, uh, to natural resources, they will tend to be depleted and overused and destroyed. Um, so you need some kind of control of access. This was fundamental for Eleanor. Usually it is the owner who stands for that. And the owner can be a private person. It can be the state. It can also be a collective, a collective of fishermen, a collective of farmers. It can be a village. And, and Eleanor showed in many, many, many articles how um, well for, for sometimes thousands of years, communities have been able to manage uh, resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if we think about Amazonia, then Thomas, there is the dilemma that the huge rainforest areas need to be protected for climate stability, and at the same time, the people living there in harsh conditions, as we know, need economic development. As an environmentalist and environmental economist, what is your comment on solving that dilemma? 
Yeah, well, I, I, it's this really the same answer that uh, more or less fragile resources, you need protection. Um, and the original population, the population have been living for a long time in the Amazon. Many of them use nature sustainably in a sensible and, and measured way. Um, when Amazon gets opened up and you get more and more people coming in uh, from outside, um, then uh, they can sometimes bring with them very destructive uh, technologies and, and, um, and the result can be a disaster. Mm. That is always the case with open access. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Thomas. I now turn to you, Marie. Uh, both you and Eduardo have been working with the IPES um, and especially on the major report on biodiversity. And I, I know that you have prepared a few questions for Eduardo. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to get this opportunity. And my question goes on the same line a bit like Thomas. This, uh, and you, it was mentioned on the film, the quite rapid migration and uh, by that urbanization and also marginalization of people that was shown in the picture. So my question is, is it's a good quality of life possible really for all people now living in the Amazonia, I mean both the urban and the rural ones, uh, without the deteriorating nature, what are the possible um, ways towards uh, sustainability that takes care of both environment and humans that you see and doing so in a fair and equitable way? Thank you for this question. Let me start this way. I think as scientists, it's our responsibility to have hope. Right? and to see that it's possible to reconcile uh, our development needs and you know, protect uh, the nature that we depend so much on. But when it comes for the Amazon, the Amazon is one of the regions that has generated some of the, the most wealth for the world. And it has always been seen as an El Dorado for outsiders. Right? So I think, and have left behind the problems, the deterioration, the poverty, and the violence. We are at a particular time now that this is an important point, which is we, we have more than ever, you know, we're thinking about the Amazon and it's important for the globe, for the climate, for biodiversity, for water, and for commodities. I think we need to revert that equation. I think we need also to start talking about the Amazon for Amazonians' sake. If we address the problems of the Amazon, if we address the problems of the people in the Amazon, the global contributions will come. So to revert that equation, we need to revert that idea that the region is there to provide to our wealth. Right? And that means that the wealth of the region needs to stay and be generated in the region. It needs to include the people of the region. Value aggregation needs to be done closer to producers. And beyond the environmental issues that are there, the Amazon needs a lot of infrastructure, mm -hmm. infrastructures that contribute to the life of people. So uh, I think we know the formula. We know that we need to generate resource there. We need to confront the complex problems that we have in the region, the rural, the urban, the indigenous. And we need to put the Amazonian people up front. Right? That will create an Amazon that is more just and that will benefit the world as a whole. Thank you very much. And you kind of touched upon my next question, really. is I'm very glad to see you here in November in Gothenburg, though it's maybe not the best season to get here. Uh, and we seem to be quite far away from the Amazons. Yeah. But, but the world is global and interconnected. So my question is, what can we do here? Um, if you could say in Europe or Western Europe. Uh, in this part of the world to enhance sustainability in the Amazons. Uh, how can we enhance what you just said? That's, a, that's a, also an important question. But let me start like this. These problems are complex, like here and there. And I think one important issue is that we face complexity, but we recognize that every single contribution is important at all levels. So complexity cannot paralyze us. So there are different kinds of actions for different sectors in this part of the world or other parts of the world that are important. For instance, you think about markets, and we heard before about responsible value chains, right? and certification and fair trades that gives incentives and support for those who are producing in a sustainable and socially just way. Investments, 
we are entering a phase of enormous amount of climate investments, of biodiverse investments. Those investments need to have and be tied to social issues, right? So they also have uh, an impact, not only on what benefits the planet as a whole, but you know, on the people on the ground. Uh, and finally, consumers. As consumers, we have a lot of power, and we have a lot of power to empower people who are doing good things on the ground. There are thousands of initiatives in the Amazon. We saw the example of one cooperative by producers who is developing technology, aggregating value right in the region, generating resource, taxes, employment, and supporting, uh, you know, uh, production systems that are sustainable. We need to support them as well, so they can continue to do what they do. Thank you very much, Eduardo and Marie, and thank you to the panel. We need to move on in the, in the program now.